books during that time, and then uh, the time came, and God said, all right, I want to launch you out into the deep, and we're going to go ahead and um, just uh, have a full-on ministry of just writing and speaking, and so that's what I've been doing uh, the past uh, 10 or so years, and the Lord has, has uh, really blessed me and been able to write um, some 38 books, and uh, so I'm just... Uh, a writing machine now. God's got me doing this, uh, which is a pretty interesting uh, phenomenon considering I never read anything deeper than a comic book until I was age 16. So uh, I was one of these uh, prodigal kids and that God uh, just snatched me uh, as a brand from the fire. Um, I do a podcast each week called the Vintage Truth Podcast, and uh, we've got about 380 episodes up right now on a variety of biblical topics, doctrine, theology, Christian life, prophecy, you name it, and um, also have the Vintage Truth app that uh, you can download on your phone. You can watch those podcasts uh, as well. Um, got a book coming out this summer with Dr. Mark Hitchcock called The Global Reset, uh, which uh, a little bit, we're going to touch on that a little bit today. And uh, so uh, very exciting. These are very exciting times. And by the way, Maranatha to you this morning. Amen. May the Lord come. And, and I am honored. Thank you so much, Tommy, for that. And, and thank you, Dr. Ed Heinsen, for um, inviting me to, to speak in his stead this morning. You know, I, I, I quite uh, anticipate somebody coming up to me at some time today saying, you know, I know Ed Heinsohn. Ed Heinsohn's a friend of mine. I serve with Ed Heinsohn. My friend, you're no Ed Heinsohn. I get it, okay? I get it. It's, a, it's a, one of these uh, pr rare privileges that God uh, lets me have, so I'm uh, very glad to be here. I, um, I read the story of a young minister who was interviewing for a job uh, at a church, and he was before the pulpit committee. And uh, they began asking ask him some questions, began to sort of grill him, as, you know, pulpit committees tend to do sometimes. And so the committee chairman asked him, he said, son, do you, do you know the Bible pretty good? The young minister said, well, yeah, pretty good. The chairman asked, well, what part of the Bible do you know the best? And he said, well, I, I guess I know the New Testament the best. He said, well, what part of the New Testament do you know the best? The young minister said, well, several parts of the New Testament I know. He said, well, why don't you then tell us the story of the prodigal son? So the young minister said, sure, I'll be happy to do that. So he began. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus who went down to Jericho by night, and he fell among stony, stony ground, and the thorns choked him half to death. The next morning, Solomon and his wife Gomorrah came by and carried him down to the ark for Moses to be taken care of. But as he was going through the eastern gate into the ark, he caught his hair in a limb. And he hung there 40 days and 40 nights, and afterwards he did hunger, and the ravens came and fed him. The next day the three wise men came and carried him down to the boat dock, and he caught a ship to Nineveh. And when he got there, he found Delilah sitting on a wall, and he said, Chunk her down, boys, chunk her down. And they said, How many times shall we chunk her down? Till seven times seven? He said, Nay, but 70 times seven. And they chunked her down 490 times. And she burst asunder in their midst. And they picked up 12 baskets with the leftovers. <laughs> and in the resurrection, whose wife shall she be? <clears throat> the committee chairman suddenly interrupted the young minister and said to the remainder of the committee, fellas, I think we ought to ask the church to call this young man as our minister. He's awfully young, but he sure does know his Bible. <laughs> well... I, I hope we know our Bibles a little bit, uh, a little bit better than that. Um, but that's what we're here to do. We're here to learn from God. We're here to hear from God. And we're here to celebrate the fact that Jesus Christ is coming back for his church. My friend, every day, I, I love it. Thank you so much, Pastor, for that excellent devotional exposition of those passages because this is the hope that we live with. Uh, this is the thing that drives us forward every day. Some days when you get out of bed, your feet about to touch the floor, you think about, what about today? What, what reason do I have uh, to get up today? And the reason is, is because Jesus Christ could come back today. Uh, we believe that. And uh, I am so thankful that, that I was able to, to study under men like Dr. Walvard and Pentecost and Toussaint and Howard Hendricks and all these men who invested into me, as, as did many of you who are here today. But they gave us the baton. And the baton is not something to keep to ourselves. It's something to do what? To pass on to the next generation. A few years ago, I, um, I wrote a book. Uh, it was a biography, actually, of a young a football player, American football player by the name of Brandon Burlesworth. It's really one of the most amazing stories you'll ever read. And uh, years later, after writing that book, it became a bestseller, and I was approached to sell the movie rights to the book. And so after many years, finally the movie came together. It's actually on Netflix right now. It's called Greater. 
greater is the story. It's an amazing faith-based story. But the thing about the story that impacted me the most was that while I was on the movie set, watching the movie be made, I saw my words being portrayed into the movie. And I saw how movies were made. I saw behind the scenes, the things that you don't see behind the camera. I saw the, the narration of the director coming through. I saw his vision coming through. And then once I saw the movie, I was able to understand the movie even better because I knew how the movie had been made. Well, my friends, that's exactly what Bible prophecy does for us. We know how the movie is made. God has delineated that. He has specified that in Scripture. And so when we see it playing out before our very eyes, we understand more. As David said, I have more understanding and discernment than all my teachers. And understanding Bible prophecy for us is, is like those night vision goggles that Navy Teal, uh, SEAL Team 6 uses. It enables you to see things in the dark. You can detect heat signatures that no one else can see. And that's what Bible prophecy does for us. It enables us to discern the times in which we are living. Those who study Bible prophecy know that God has a prophetic plan for the ages. But Satan also has a plan. Satan also has a vision, has an agenda. And for 6,000 years, he has longed to accomplish his agenda. And that agenda includes to be God, to rule the earth, and to have the world's population worship him. However, in order for that agenda to take place, several things have to happen. Satan has to bring together essential elements to, in essence, reset the world, as we've been talking about. And so today I want to talk about these four pillars of Satan's globalist agenda and talk about how he is bringing those together uh, right now, these four essential elements. And each one of these, by the way, is predicated upon crisis, crisis. The first is this. In order to accomplish his agenda, he must unite the governments of the nations. And Mark Hitchcock so eloquently said last night when he talked about Daniel chapter 2 about this final globalist regime, this final empire that will be a ten-nation kingdom or a revived Roman empire. Of course, it'll have a political, economic, and religious element to that. My good buddy Todd Hampson has so beautifully illustrated this here. And this kingdom is going to come together. And we actually see elements of it happening right now. The Bible tells us that this ten-king alliance will be representative of some of the most powerful nations of the world. And here's the thing we have to keep in mind, though, is that kingdoms and empires and countries can change in an instant. Is that nothing is permanent in this world. And kingdoms and countries can can form new multinational alliances. They can conglomerate together with other governments, and they can collapse before our very eyes. And we've seen this happen even economically. It's even possible that the current European Union could be represented in, one, in just one of these ten toes, these, these ten kingdoms. We really don't know specifically how it's going to come together. But here's what we do know, is that a unified global government system will be formed in the last day. So where do we see evidence of this in our modern day. Well, as we look at history, we see that beginning really with the League of Nations in the modern world, uh, formed on January 10th, 1920, after World War I, they came together, these nations, the allied nations, along with Germany, and they said, all right, here's our purpose. We're going to bring international peace to the world. That's our job. Well, as you well know, that didn't last very long, and along came World War II. And at the end of World War II, and, and we're fighting again with Germany, right? Into World War II, they come together, and we defeat Germany and Japan, and right after that, the United Nations was formed. Why were the, was the United Nations formed? It was formed to bring and maintain and to guarantee world peace. That's why they were there. Shortly after that, 1946, speaking at the University of Zurich, Winston Churchill said that we need to form what he called the United States of Europe, the United States of Europe, and why do we need to come together? He says, in order to have world peace, in order for the nations to be united and to preserve that. Then on March 25th, 1957, these six nations came together, France, West Germany, Italy, the Netherlands, Belgium, and Luxembourg, and they signed a document establishing the European Economic Community, also known as the European Common Market, which is the modern day European Union. Interesting, the treaty that they signed was called the Treaty of Rome, the Treaty of Rome. Fast forward now to 
2009, their Lisbon Treaty, which now includes 27 nations representing about a half a billion people, they signed to enact a, an office called the President of Europe, who has a, a service time of two and a half years. They missed it by one year. I think somebody got their math wrong on that thing. But it's a preview, I think, not necessarily the European Union, but it's a preview of the spirit of the age. We continue, continually try to find ways to come together as one. The world is shrinking, my friend. And nations are looking for and finding reasons to come together and to unite. Coming forward to the present day, we find that when COVID hit, it circled the globe about as fast as a Chinese hypersonic missile. And how quickly the world changed. It used to take months, perhaps even years, for the world to have this sort of rippling impact, these aftershocks, but now the world can change on a dime. And on the heels of the COVID fiasco, the COVID crisis, the COVID chaos, came immediate calls for a global governance system. This, they say, is the solution to getting rid of COVID and making the world safe once again. And so you had men like uh, former Prime Minister Tony Blair, Gordon Brown, and the former Assistant Secretary or the former Secretary General of the United Nations, Ban Ki moon, calling for this global governance system. In fact, Moon says this, he says, I call upon the united efforts of the G20 leadership, the International Monetary Fund, and the World Bank to join us in our support of this global governance system. He said, I want to appeal to human rights, to solidarity, to justice. Of course, it's those terms that they define with their own meanings. And he says, if we do this, we will be responsible global citizens. You say they want to break down national nationality. They want to dissolve borders. And no longer are you to be a citizen of your country. You must be a citizen of the world. And in order to be a citizen of the world, you have to get on board with whatever the world agenda is of this new world government. It's global unity. They want us to be one. Currently, this man, Ban Ki-moon, is the deputy chair of the Elders, which is an independent group of international leaders working together, they say, for peace, justice, and human rights. And among their chief tenets of their agenda is to have cooperation among all nations, of course, peace, universal health coverage, don't forget that, and of course, battling climate change and justice for all. But in order for this agenda to take effect, there has to be a great reset. There has to be a great reset. In other words, the world has to, to stop turning, and we have to reset and push the recalibration button. We have to change everything about the way we are doing things right now. And among the chief leaders in this uh, global unified effort is a man by the name of Klaus Schwab, who is the president and founder of the World Economic Forum. Now, I just need to say this right now. Does this guy not look like a Bond villain to you? I mean, he just needs to be on the next uh, James Bond movie. He just looks nefarious. You know, there's something about this guy, you know. But, um, but Klaus Schwab has been convening with the global elite since 1971 in the relatively obscure little town of Davos, Switzerland. And they've been convening every year, these global elites, president of world banks, world leaders, presidents, premiers, prime ministers, coming together to brainstorm on how we're going to take over the world, how we're going to reset this world and bring in a whole new kind of regime. One of the things that Schwab has said is that the problem we have is not really globalization. The problem is a lack of global governance. We need to be in charge of the world. You see, they see the world as being out of control. They don't like the fact that America can go over and play in its own neighborhood and Germany and Switzerland can go play in their neighborhood. But we, we need to be in the same neighborhood. In fact, one of the, the ways they've described this whole COVID phenomenon is that we're not disconnected from one another. In fact, we're all on the same ship. And it just happens to be that the person down the, the aisle, down the road, down the hall from you has contracted this, this disease. And so everybody needs to get on board to eradicate this thing because if not, the whole ship is going to go down. And so this whole idea of fear-mongering. In fact, they've seized upon the crisis. Klaus Schwab has said this, the pandemic represents a rare but narrow opportunity, window of opportunity to, re to reflect, to reimagine, and to reset our world, our world. Now, 
Schwab is not the first person to want to bring about a new world. In fact, we were talking yesterday at a luncheon, <clears throat> the name uh, Constance Cumbie came up. You talked about that, Thomas. Well, the person who invented the phrase New Age was a, a spiritualist by the name of Alice Bailey. And she coined this term New Age. She wrote many, many books, and this was sort of before the New Age came into its own. But this is one of the things she wrote in her book. She said, I dedicate myself anew to the service of the coming one and will do all I can to prepare men's hearts and minds for that event. I have no other life intention. And then she adds, first of all, this coming one will come to a world which is essentially one world. You see, they're preparing the way for the coming one. In order to receive this one who's going to rule over us all, we have to come together as one so that we're ready for him when he arrives. Another person by the name of Robert Mueller, not Robert Mueller, okay, from the Trump administration, but Robert Mueller. Here was a man back in the 40s who, who wrote an essay to the United Nations, and it was chosen as their prize-winning essay. They invited him to come on board to be an intern at the United Nations. He eventually worked himself up to the position of the Assistant Secretary General of the United Nations. And he spent many, many years, decades, as a part of that organization. After that, he, he found this uh, University of Global Peace. He wrote over 6,000 poems on world unity and world peace. And in his farewell testimony to the United Nations, he says this, he says, no human force will ever be able to destroy the United Nations. For the UN is not merely a building or merely an idea. It is not a man-made creation. The United Nations is the vision light of the absolute supreme, which is slowly, steadily, and unerringly illuminating the ignorance, the night of our human life. At his choice hour, the absolute supreme will ring on his own victory bell here on earth through the loving and serving heart of the United Nations. You see, Mueller had this idea that the UN was going to prepare the world for this absolute supreme one who would come on the scene. Where are they getting these ideas from? They're certainly not reading the Bible. It must be coming from some other supernatural spiritual force. Mueller went on to say this, we must move as quickly as possible to a one-world government, a one-world religion, under a one-world leader. And, of course, he's not the only one, again, to say this. Paul Henry Spake, the former Belgian prime minister and one of the architects of what eventually became the European Union, uh, wrote this. He says, we do not want another committee. We have too many already. What we want is a man of sufficient stature to hold the allegiance of all the people and to lift us out of the economic morass into which we are sinking. Send us such a man, and be he God or devil, we will receive him. You see, the world doesn't really care who this person is. They just want peace, they want safety, and to coin a term that was used earlier, they want hope. The world is longing for that type of hope. So what could be the catalyst that could catapult the world's nations into this sort of unity coming together? What global emergency, what planetary predicament could be so severe, so acute, so devastating that nations would, in essence, just dissolve past differences and conflicts, they'd dissolve their borders, and they would come together under a global economic umbrella and common pursuits. What could they do for that? Well, I'll guarantee you this. They're going to ride that COVID pony for as long as they can. They're going to milk that thing to death. They're going to squeeze that thing as long as they can. As long as they can get fear out of the COVID pandemic, they're going to use it. Because, my friend, in case you haven't figured this out yet, fear is a fantastic motivator. It's a fantastic manipulator. And the governments of this world have come together under the same narrative to say, we're going to shock you into submission, in essence. And so they're going to do this, not only with COVID, they're going to do it with every new so-called variant that comes after them, the variant of the month club, I call it. And so they're going to continue to be these seismic aftershocks from this initial uh, COVID thing that has happened. And so, again, the stated agenda of these global elites is to bring economic quality, healing to the planet, and, of course, social justice. Now, just from a surface reading of that, that sounds kind of noble. It sounds kind of virtuous. I mean, but what does it practically look like? Well, as was mentioned earlier, someone said that, you know, this climate change thing, and it really is in this uh, current Biden bill, is poised to tax us into oblivion. Basically, they want you to pay for the planet. 
They want you to suffer for the planet and to stop using resources. And, of course, we know that uh, in certain places of the world, they turn the power off uh, because we're, we're trying to preserve the planet here. Anything, anything for the planet. But let's just back up just for a second and get a spiritual perspective. All of these things we're seeing very clearly happen. And anyone who's discerning can see everything that I've just mentioned. But what most people cannot see are the spiritual forces behind these things. What's really happening was written thousands of years ago in Psalm 2. Listen to what the psalmist said. Why are the nations in an uproar and the peoples devising a vain thing? The kings of the earth take their stand and rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let us tear their fetters apart and cast away their cords from us. You see, this is just but a mask attempt, a veiled attempt to get rid of God in the world. We're trying to vote God off the planet by majority vote. And if we can't get him out by majority, we'll steal the election. That's what we'll do. It, it is as it was in the days of Noah, when virtually all the people on the planet were anti-God, they were godless, they were full of violence, they were full of sexual immorality, and they were full of hatred for God. They wanted to do their own thing. We simply want to vote God off the island. And eventually, uh, they'll have at least a modicum of that, uh, that answered prayer. But listen to what the verse says. God responds, He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. Then he will speak to them in his anger and terrify them in his fury, saying, But as for me, I have installed my king upon Zion, my holy mountain. My friend, even though things loom ahead in the short distance, in the short future, we know the end of the story. We're not leaving the theater before the movie's over with. There's a great ending to this story, and we get to be a part of it. King Jesus is going to reign on this planet. Amen? And no human authority, no human king can prevent that from happening. I love what Isaiah wrote in Isaiah 40. It says, God looks at the kings of the earth. It says they are nothing to him. In fact, it says they are less than nothing. They are like the fine dust you find on the scales after you weigh the scales. And it says God merely blows on them, and they wither, and they are no more. That's how sovereign our God is. No one can stay his hand. No one can say, what are you doing? All of his plans will be accomplished. We have that hope in our hearts, that confident expectation. And yet this one world government is a part of that greater sovereign plan to allow this thing to happen. Uh, Todd Hampson and I had Michelle Bachman on our show uh, a couple of weeks ago, and um, we were talking to her about, she'd just returned the day before uh, from Rome, and she'd been meeting with the uh, Italian parliament. And among the things she told us was she said they were producing a bill or submitting a bill to Parliament that said two things. Number one, it says that, uh, that transgenderism was now going to be taught to as low as nursery school age kids, to teach that whole idea that you can become something else. The second thing was they were introducing a bill in Italy to ban the teaching of the book of Genesis in that country. Because as you know, God had the audacity to claim that he created them male and female. Now, fortunately, that bill did not pass. But this is what she said. She said concerning the whole idea of a global government coming, she said they're already acting as if this thing is in, is in power. In other words, they're proceeding as if they've already been voted into power. And they've, they've taken down uh, national monuments in Italy, and they're naming them world monuments as a part of anticipating this uh, global reset agenda. So one of the pillars of Satan's globalist strategy is he must unite the nations in order to be uh, over them. Second thing is he has to deceive humanity. He has to deceive humanity. Now again, this COVID crisis is a perfect storm for this to happen. Imagine... Imagine two years ago at this conference, someone getting up and making this statement, saying that in a matter of months, your own government will issue federal guidelines and mandates telling you when you can leave your house, where you can go, when and if you can gather at your church for worship, when you can breathe without a face covering apparatus, when and, when you, when and where you could travel, whether or not you can continue your business, whether or not you will still have a job, 
and demanding that you be injected with a government-approved uh, approved chemical whose manufacturers you cannot sue in case of adverse effects or death and whose contents and development you cannot know for another 55 years. Tommy, you'd run that person off the stage. That sounds like communist China. That sounds like Russia. That sounds like Solzhen, uh, Solzhenitsyn. That sounds like some sort of regime like Nazi Germany. And yet here it is, and good old God bless America. That is exactly what has happened. At no time in my lifetime, and I dare say in anyone's lifetime in this room, has the entire planet been focused on one thing. Not even World War I. There were countries not involved. Not World War II. Not 9-11. Not the Kennedy assassination. No crisis has ever seismically impacted planet Earth like this COVID crisis. My friend, Satan is dancing right now because he knows this is all a part of his globalist agenda. And if he can ride this thing all the way to get us into submission, he'll keep doing it. But there'll be other crises to come after that. Now, I want to show you something here that's just simply an observation. This is all this is, is simply an observation. When we study Bible prophecy, we see that there's, there are thematic prophetic patterns that, that are observed as we all look through the Scripture. Any person in this room can observe this pattern. You look at a crisis that will come in the end days, followed by a chaos, followed by calm, which then will be followed by some compliance, and then eventually by control. And the way we see this happening is, of course, we believe the, the greatest crisis will be the rapture. And then there'll be chaos following the rapture. How much time that'll be, we don't know. There's obviously going to be some period of time between the rapture and the signing of the peace treaty of Daniel 9, the Antichrist, with Israel. But there'll be calm at that point when he signs that, that treaty. It'll be peace and safety for all. Then comes the compliance. The people will begin to get used to this uh, Antichrist government. This is the new regime. It's the new world order. This is the world we live in now. We'll be compliant. And then ultimately, there'll be total control with obviously economic restrictions, the mark of the beast. Uh, there'll be a total allegiance pledge to the Antichrist. Now, those are things that are undeniable for us in the prophetic community. But then we look at what's happened or what actually is happening right now in our world, what has already happened. What we see is there's been a crisis with this COVID thing. There's been chaos with panic and fear. The calm is, we'll just take two weeks to flatten the curve. Oh, it's okay, wear a mask. Well, then social distance. Well, then shelter in place. Compliance. Now we have uh, tens of millions of Americans who have now taken the vaccine. And plus, we'll give you some money, if you don't mind. We'll print some money up and give it to you to keep you happy in the meantime. And then that comes, there comes the buy-in. And then eventually, they say we're going to be in perpetual uh, pandemic mode. There'll be more mandates for perhaps vaccine passports in other places other than L.A. and New York. And then also, what else? What other crisis is going to come? What other variant of COVID is going to come that's going to be so frightening from a media narrative standpoint that we're actually going to allow the government to control us? Now, this is just simply an observation. This is not the fulfillment of Bible prophecy. I was interviewed by a lady from the Washington Post, and she asked me, she said, do you think this, is, uh, this means that we're in the last days, that we're in the book of Revelation? I said, absolutely not. I said, this is not the fulfillment of Revelation 6. It's not the fulfillment of Luke 21, 11. None of these things are taking place right now. But what we're seeing is the preview. We're seeing the preseason. We're seeing the warm-up. Satan's testing the waters to see how close he can get to jump-starting the tribulation. You see, if Satan had his finger on the button, if he was able to go ahead and start this thing, don't you think he would do it right now? If he could get his, his hands on the, the, the control sticks of the world, he would certainly do it right now. He's being prevented. We'll talk more about that in a minute. But part of him doing this is he is redefining some key foundational truths and thus reality itself. This is how he's deceiving humanity today. Let me give you four ways uh, that he's enacting uh, the beginnings of this uh, grand delusion. The first is in the area of morality. Isaiah 5.20 says, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil. This is exactly where we're living right now. We're living in an age where people boldface, believe, sincerely believe that what is good is evil and what is evil is good. Uh, Christians are, moral, morally speaking, are being pushed to the edges and to the margins of society. Your views are old-fashioned. They're outdated. They're archaic. Why do you even believe them anymore? Man, get on with the new world here. Get up with the program here. Nobody believes you anymore. This is the narrative that Satan is propounding. 
And then we see, of course, in Romans, uh, we don't have time to to get in the passage today, but Romans 1, 28 uh, through 32 uh, talks about the completion of God's abandonment, wrath. And we see how God is just gradually taking his hand off of a culture that continues to reject him. And uh, we'll talk more about that in just a second. I talk about in my book, Aftershocks, about uh, the classic George Orwell, uh, 1984, which he he coins this term called news, news speak which is the government's language propaganda machine. It's kind of the fact checkers of today, if you will. Uh, People coming in, you know, some or most of this may be false according to independent fact checkers who happen to work for us. That's really how that works. And this whole idea of newspeak, where they label you as misinformation. How many of you guys have been pulled from YouTube or kicked off Twitter Or off of Facebook, yeah, many of us here have experienced that. Why? Because the official narrative, the official uh, language approval machine of the government has told you that you're telling the lies. Essentially, Newspeak curtails free thought and expression while replacing them with the party's own words for your peace and safety, of course. Another term that Orwell coined was the concept of doublethink which is the idea that you can simultaneously hold to contradictory beliefs while sincerely believing they're both true. So in other words, you can believe in war, but but you can also believe in peace, but really war is peace. Freedom is slavery, and ignorance is strength. This doublespeak in his book is employed to deliberately obscure, distort, disguise, or redefine words in order to make them more easily acceptable to the general public. Now listen, we're not completely there yet, but we are well on our way. It's almost as if we're living in this 1984 world. Satan is the master of doublespeak. Jesus called him in John 8, the father of lies. Doesn't just mean he was the first to lie, it means he's really good at it. And here's the deal. Satan is so good at deception that people don't even know they're deceived. Because watch this. When you're deceived, you don't know you're deceived because you're deceived. Okay? That's how that works. That's why when you speak to someone about Bible prophecy or about truth or about God's word or about just something something really radical like men are men and women are women, something that radical, They look at you like you just stepped off an alien spacecraft, okay? That's doublespeak. That's newspeak. That's doublethink. Let me give you a couple ways that this is happening, how Satan is using this process. Murder of the unborn isn't really murder anymore. Oh, oh, it's not. What is it? We call it health care. We call it reproductive freedom. A child, we used to think a child was what was living in a woman's womb. No longer. We don't call it a child. We call it a fetus. We call it a clump of cells. We call it a cyst that has to be removed. In 2015, the hashtag shout your abortion went viral. And women began having parties like bridal showers to celebrate the slaughter of their young children. There were marches and there were parades. There are t-shirts that are being made. They give them party hats. They celebrate this today. And it's celebrated worldwide. By the way, Keep your eye on the Supreme Court and what's happening right now. And this decision is supposed to come down in June. Let's see what happens. Let's see if the Supreme Court returns the sovereignty of, concerning Roe v. Wade back to the states. And, of course, the opponents of that have promised a revolution in America if it happens. You want to see these radicals get upset? Wait till that happens. Here's another way. Homosexuality is, not, is love now. It's love, not an unnatural abomination inviting God's judgment as the Bible proclaims. Another one, marriage between members of the same sex is now labeled, according to our Supreme Court, as a basic human right, according to the United States Supreme Court. By the way, during the intertestamental period, Jewish scholars came together and they were commenting on the book of Genesis. And they say, in this, during this extra-biblical intertestamental period, that... During the days of Noah, there were marriage contracts written between homosexuals and even songs composed for homosexual weddings. They say that was the last straw for God to release the flood. And at no time, in fact, this is written in the briefs of 
the Supreme Court uh, ruling on this, where they say that at no time in their knowledge, in the history of civilization, have there been marriage contracts between homosexuals until now. Well, the Jewish scholars claim it happened in the days of Noah. And look what, what God did to civilization during that time. So certainly it's an act uh, and an indication of judgment. Now it's law, by the way. Uh, it's a betrayal of biology, a perversion of morality, and a sabotage to civilization. And so they've made basically uh, unrighteousness the law. And I remember at that time, you remember this too, that when that decision was passed in, in June of 2015, then President Obama lit up the White House in the colors of the gay flag. Not just that. I distinctly remember seeing a photograph of him in the Oval Office dancing and celebrating that decision. And here we have this revered piece of real estate we call the Oval Office. It's being desecrated uh, with this insanity. Gender is now fluid and malleable. It's no longer biological, determined, and fixed at conception like science used to say. But now we have, uh, it, it is a construct of thought and feelings and life experiences. Men can magically transform into women by simply saying the words or simply feeling it and speaking it into existence. Reality itself is no longer based upon truth or facts as we have mistakenly presumed since the dawn of time. Instead, reality is what you perceive it to be, what you feel it to be. You see, as Oprah said, that great theologian, she said, whatever your truth is, is what truth is. My friend, that's a part of a grand deception. And so we see what, that moral standards are fastly becoming obsolete, that morality itself is becoming extinct. And there are no moral absolutes except, of course, for that statement, which is a moral absolute statement. So Satan attacks on the area of morality. Another way he does is through virtue. Is that Satan comes in and he hijacks what most in this list are Christian values. Inherently Judeo-Christian values. He hijacks them. He reimagines them. He redefines them. He repackages them. And he resells them to the world. And so now we have different <clears throat> meanings for the words acceptance. That means you don't judge or exclude anyone ever. Uh, unity and diversity mean something completely different. Com and by the way, unity is a great thing. The only question is, over what are you uniting? That's really the question. Unity is a biblical concept, but it's what are you uniting over? So sometimes even in the body of Christ, well, we just need to come together. We just need to unite. But I say unite over what? You can't unite over heresy. You can't unite over biblical and doctrinal aberration. You've got to unite over the, the revealed word of God. That's what unites us is Jesus Christ and his word. Compassion, justice has been completely hijacked in our society. No one knows what justice is anymore. It's just whatever you des decided to be. If you don't get justice, you simply burn down a city. That's how you get your justice. Spirituality, uh, they've redefined bigotry and, and prejudice now. Hatred is simply if you disagree with someone else. So you can't have any sort of healthy discussion or disagreement. It's all now hatred. Forgiveness, thing of the past. If we, if we cancel you out there in the world, then there's no way we're going to forgive you anymore. I don't care if you did it when you were 10 years old. You're canceled. I don't know if even your father did it when you, he was 10 years old. You're, by proxy, are canceled. Truth, of course, is redefined and martyrdom as well. Now we have Islamic terrorists being martyred, supposedly, for their faith. Here's another area we touched on earlier is the planet. Uh, he's, he's trying to sell this delusion to the whole planet about the planet. Critical to the globalist agenda is the indoctrination of a shift in thinking with regards to the planet and the environment. The idea is a full-on propaganda campaign which has been lost, and being lost, by the way, through, uh, through Congress right now, <clears throat> is that humanity now becomes subservient to the earth itself. So the idea is that we are here, we exist to serve Mother Earth, not vice versa. And again, they'll tax us to death for the sake of the planet. If you resist this narrative, you're a climate denier, you've probably been called that, you're anti-science, you're anti-intellectual, or you're just a flat earther. That's basically uh, where that uh, happens. Now, the World Economic Forum has chimed in on this whole idea. You can go on their website and read these very words. They said that their, their goal is for us to serve Mother Earth, to serve the planet. 
And, and again, this mirrors the early stages of abandonment that we see in Romans chapter 1. And, and the protocol goes like this, is that once we see the revealed truth of who God is, that he is, that he has divine attributes, that he's there, that he's supernatural, that he's powerful, those things are undeniable. Uh, Spurgeon called uh, the stars God's traveling preachers. Uh, he would go, they would go across the sky and I just declaring the, the glory of God, Psalm 19. But watch this. Once we see who the creator is, we don't want the creator to to have authority in our lives, so what do we do? We reject it, we suppress the truth, the Bible says in Romans 1, in unrighteousness. Now, we're free to do that. We have the ability to do that as, as individuals, as a society, as a planet, but God says there's no freedom in the consequences after that. He says once you take the truth about who I am, God says, and about who you are, you're the creation, by the way, and the fact that you've been made in my image, you take that away, here's what happens. God says, I'm going to turn the lights down on you. I'm going to darken your mind. I'm going to harden your heart. We take the lights in this room, just darken them, and it'd be harder to see. And then God says what happens is, is that he turns the lights out completely. It's a total spiritual blackout is what happens when we reject God as creator and for who he is. And what's the result of that? Well, Scripture tells us in Romans 1 that we began to speculate in fact, it says that our hearts are darkened and we become futile in our speculations. What does that mean? Well, it means we have to start guessing. If you're in a dark room and you're blind, you don't know what's going on. You have to guess about what's going on. You have to think about perceiving things. Well, I feel like this is happening. I hope this will happen. I want this to happen, but you don't know. So they begin to speculate about God the creator, about spirituality, about eternity, about religion, and that's why it says they begin to worship the creation, not the creator. And what's crazy, you know, Ephesians chapter 4 echoes this. Paul wrote to the Ephesians in chapter 4 verse 17. says, so this I say and affirm together with the Lord that you no longer walk just as the Gentiles also walk in the futility of their mind, being darkened in their understanding, excluded from the life of God because of the ignorance that is within them because of the hardness of their heart. And they, having become callous, have given themselves over to sensuality for the practice of every kind of impurity with greediness. That's just mirroring what Romans 1 says. And, and also, 1 Corinthians 2.14, for the, the, the natural man does not accept the things of the spiritual God, uh, uh, the things of God. Why? Because these are things that are spiritually appraised, spiritually understood. This is why in the world today, you should not be surprised when non-Christians do what they do or say what they say, or think what they think, or propagate what they tell you is true. They have nothing to draw from but themselves. There is no spirituality. There is no truth about them. And so the natural man does this, and a whole world full of natural men and women are going to produce that kind of culture. And so they end up speculating uh, futilely and creating, or inventing rather, and this is where we are right now. They invent a new reality that bears no resemblance to fact, truth, science, or human reason. And here's the crazy thing about that. <laughs> even then, even then, they still think they know what's going on. Even though they're blind and deaf and dead and darkened, they still think they're smarter than God. They still think they know more than the Word of God. And God's response to that in verse 22 of Romans 1, he says, they became fools. Fools. It's the Greek word moros, which around the turn of the last century was coined by an American psychiatrist, uh, the term moron, which means a simple-minded person that can't put two thoughts together. That's what that means. You say, Jeff, are you calling non-Christians morons? No, I'm not. God is. He says, you're a moros to think you're smarter than me. How dare we? And yet that's where we think we are. That's how arrogant uh, we believe that we are. This is the garden lie. You shall be as God. Let's move on quickly. Another area is, is human identity. We've got till 2 o'clock, right, Tommy? Okay, go ahead. I just want to make sure. <clears throat> human identity. The last remaining trace of God's image in mankind is the recognition that we are indeed who God made us, male and female. And yet Satan is attacking that foundation. The transgender perversion has exploded, not only with adults falling under the delusion, but 
as young as grammar school children beginning to identify as people of the, uh, the different uh, gender, a different sex. And yet this illustrates once again that once you reject the creator, this is all you have uh, left. Reimagining sex itself isn't enough. Enticing unfaithfulness in marriage isn't enough. Satan's goal is to completely erase the human hard drive, wiping it cleaner than Hillary's servers. <laughs> he wants to extract every ounce and memory that, that you are a created being in the image of God. And he's well on his way to doing that. He wants to remove any and all data which could trace back to God as creator in your heart and then replace it with his own deceptive lies and narrative. So it goes something like this. You're not happy in your marriage? Try somebody else. You're not happy with the opposite sex? Try the same sex. You're not happy with being a man? Try being a woman. You're not a man or a woman. You have the ability to flow back and forth according to your will, according to your emotions. In fact, you're not even created at all. You're sim you simply appeared after trillions of previously transitionary forms, so why not continue transitioning to a higher and happier level of existence if you can't go to another gender than go on to being a god? Just self-worship and be happy with yourself. And this is basically where a lot of churches are today. As one pastor said, most churches are nothing more than a rock show and a light show followed by a TED Talk. I'm here to make you feel good about yourself. I want you to leave with a smile on your face. This is all the devil's lie. To try to build up just our failing self-image. You can imagine yourself to be anybody you want to. You have that power. You are your own God. And if you deny anybody, anybody's ability to do that or you say something against that, you may suffer the same fate as Representative Jim Banks of Idaho did recently when he said in a tweet that uh, he called uh, Rachel Levine a man who believes he's a woman who was appointed by President Biden as Assistant Secretary of Health. Oh, the irony. He called him a man, called him a he, and he was banned from Twitter for a while until he apologized, until he groveled to Twitter and came back. See, Satan's one world strategy includes destroying the last vestiges of God's image in us, and this is precisely the kind of person that will embrace a new world order. The person who has been beaten into submission at the same time given the sense that they can be a, their own God. Here's the third pillar here. Third pillar of Satan's global strategy is to prepare for Antichrist, to prepare and position for his man of sin. And this teaching of Antichrist, you know, some people say, I wrote a whole book about called the Interview with the Antichrist, okay? So all these radio shows are asking me, well, what, what does he sound like when you interviewed him? You know, it, what does he look like? I mean, did you go to his place? He come to your place? <clears throat> it's like, well, it's a fiction novel followed by some great things about the Antichrist in the end, answer from Scripture. But, in fact, I did get an email from a guy in Germany claiming to be the Antichrist. Just so you'll know, he's in Germany, okay? And uh, he said, if you want to know any more information, just write me, you know, let me know. I'll, I'll be glad to tell you all about, you know. I'm, I'm free right now. You know, I'm not currently ruling the world, so I can answer questions and, you know, from little guys like you, Jeff. So, uh, but yeah, so, you know, the people out there like that. But why even talk about Antichrist? Let's talk about a couple of ways, or a couple of reasons why we should do that. Number one, he's in the Bible. Uh, you know, I still believe Genesis to Revelation is still fair game, okay? Every word of God is inspired. He's in the Bible, so we should think about it. He's a real person. Secondly, there are over 100 passages of Scripture that, that describe Antichrist in one way or the other. If you're a teacher here this morning, you know that repetition is a great way to drive the point home of importance of a critical point. Well, guess what? God over a hundred times says, let me tell you about Antichrist. Thirdly, he's the most prominent end times figure besides Jesus Christ himself. The Bible says more about him than anyone else besides Christ in the end times. 36 times in Revelation, he's called the beast. Again, repetition, the beast. That Greek word therion means a ravenous wild animal, although he comes on the scene more like a lamb in the beginning. Scripture also says he's definitely coming. John says, my little children, it is the last hour. If it was the last hour in the first century, what is it now? The last minute? The last few seconds? I don't know. But it's certainly close. And the Bible says the Antichrist is coming. John also told us that the spirit of Antichrist is among us. You know, the word anti means against, but it also means in place of. And we have both happening in our world today. Those philosophies, those people, those movements, this globalist agenda that is against the Christ, but it's also positioning itself to be in place of the Christ. And then finally, he is likely alive today. 
Say, do you know that for a fact? No, I don't know that for a fact. But let's just say the rapture comes in 40 years from tonight. Well, certainly the Antichrist would have to be alive right now. He's gonna, not going to be the Antichrist at age 8. You know, he's going to have to have some sense of stature and work himself into history. Well, what else do we know about Antichrist? Well, he's known by many names in Scripture. You know some of these. Obviously, he's known as the little horn in Daniel, the insolent king, the one who makes desolate, the man of lawlessness, uh, the son of destruction, Antichrist, and, of course, the beast uh, coming up out of the sea. Scripture also tells us that he's going to be an ambitious politician. And that's why a lot of people today, that they really want to nail the Antichrist. They want to know who the Antichrist is. And uh, people will come up to me at conferences and tell me who the Antichrist is. Tommy, I'm sure you've had that as well. And they're gonna, they want to whisper it in your ear because it's this secret. I had a man come up to me at a conference a couple of years ago. And uh, incredible man. He, you know, he was about 6'4". He had on overalls and a t-shirt. had a big white beard down to his waist and he had a cowboy hat on. So he must know what he's talking about. And so he comes up to me, he says, I need to tell you something. I said, what is it, sir? He said, I need to tell you who the Antichrist is. I was like, really? You know that? He's like, yeah. I said, well, come here, tell me who he is. So he came over and he whispered in, into my ear, this certain world leader. I said, wow, that's, that's very interesting. Now, may I ask how you discovered this information? He said, well, it's simple, God told me. And I said, well, aren't you special? You know, God doesn't tell anybody that's leading in the Christian community or anybody who's studied this for decades, but you got that information. You must be really special. And then I just kind of turned the conversation. I said, you know what? I don't believe we can know who the Antichrist is right now. I don't think it's going to happen until after the rapture. He said, well, you're wrong. I said, well, okay, I'll be wrong then. But I think you're wrong. And I said, I'm just going to stick to the Word of God and, and try to be uh, safe with that. But people do that all the time. In fact, I, I, I had someone come up to me at a conference a couple of years ago, and, you know, I'm, I'm signing books or talking to people or whatever, and this man just walks up, and he just looked at me in the face, and he said, Donald Trump. I said, yeah, what about him? He said, Donald Trump. And I said, okay, what do you mean by Donald Trump? He said, don't you get it? I was like, apparently not. He said, the Bible says that Jesus will come at the last trump. <laughs> I, he broke the code, yeah. I, I, love the, I love the coffee mug that my friend Olivier Melnick has. It says, I can do all things through a scripture taken out of context, you know. <laughs> and that's... That is so true. And I just said, uh, sir, I mean, I, I assume you're reading out of the King James. That word is actually trumpet. <laughs> it, it, it's an actual instrument. There's going to be an, an instrument blown. And I said, unless it's Donald Trumpet, I said, I think you're on shaky ground here. He said, no, you don't get it. What's his middle name? I said, I don't even know. He said, it's John. Who came before Jesus? John the Baptist. Now, that's some exegesis you can sink your teeth into right there. I'm telling you, friends, I, you know, all you got to do is just find a name and make it work for you, you know, kind of thing. But anyway, he's going to be an ambitious politician. Scripture says he'll be a military demagogue as well. It says he will honor a god of fortresses, a god of fortresses. Scripture tells us he'll be a master orator. He'll have the ability to charm audiences. Scripture says he'll be obviously charming, cunning, and deceptive. I like to say that the Antichrist will have the, the charm of a John F. Kennedy, the mystique of a Barack Obama, but the arrogance of an Alexander the Great. He's going to combine all the greatest qualities of world leaders and obviously nefarious ones as well. Scripture says he'll be arrogant, lawless, and blaspheming. I don't think we know what blasphemy is in our culture today. But the Antichrist is going to take it to a whole new level. He's going to blaspheme your God. Uh, scripture tells us he harbors an ancient hatred for the Jewish people. He hates the Jews. He hates the Jews because through the Jews came the Messiah. Through the Jews came the Scripture. Through the Jews came the first promise of redemption from the slavery that Satan had led the human race into. The Bible tells us that he will rise to prominence and lead the new world order. He will be energized by Satan himself. Scripture doesn't use the word possessed here. It uses the word 
energized. But I believe that Satan is one of only two people that will actually be possessed. Uh, excuse me, the Antichrist will be one of only two people actually possessed by Satan. The other being Judas Iscariot when the Bible says that Satan, Satan entered into him. Uh, Satan will eventually be possessed by, uh, excuse me, Antichrist was eventually uh, possessed by Satan. He'll suffer a fatal wound and return from the dead. Now, this is where we get into a little bit of disagreement among scholars here. Some people say, now, wait a minute, Satan is not going to raise anybody from the dead. Uh, only God can do that. And, and uh, it says he'll suffer a fatal wound as, as if he's dead. Uh, people say, well, how long is he going to be dead? We don't know. He may be dead three days to mimic, to counterfeit the death of Jesus Christ. We really don't know. Uh, but there's debate about, about this. Uh, only God can raise people from the dead. Other people say, no. When we get to the tribulation, it's going to be a time of unprecedented supernatural miracles. Obviously, we know that. We know from Revelation 13, the false prophet will call down fire from the sky. The two witnesses, fire will come out of their mouth. There's going to be a, a return to overt supernatural miracles. So there are many interpretations, but people say, yeah, I think Satan's going to be able to do that because uh, of the nature of the time and the nature of the wound in which he suffers. It says he suffers a head wound, not a hand wound, not a chest wound, but a head wound. Usually head wounds are considered to be uh, fatal. Certainly President Kennedy's not coming back from, from the dead. Secondly, the Bible actually does use the word fatal here, and the context of the passage seems to indicate there's some sort of actual verifiable death. Third, there are those who hold this view who grammatically connect the word uh, false here, to, or, or false death here, in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 11, not to the Antichrist's death, but to the effect it produces on society. In other words, it's the death, not the death that's false. It's the falsehood that Antichrist and the devil will lead the world into based upon that death, that the word false refers to believing the lie of his claim to be God. Fourth, Antichrist is first described as rising out of the sea of Gentile humanity, but over in chapter 17 of Revelation, it says that he comes up out of the abyss, indicating that he was where uh, the abode of the demons were, and Satan brought him back. And then a final clue is just that uh, the false prophet and the, the miracles that he does and the words that are used to describe that are the exact same words used to describe the miracles of Jesus. The powers, the signs, the wonders, the dunamis, the simeon, and the teros are the same words used. So whether or not it's an actual resurrection or the greatest deception of all time, here's the bottom line. It doesn't really matter. You know why? Because the world is convinced. Either way, the world is convinced. And Satan pulls off his greatest trick of all time time. He, along with the false prophet, will enact this whole mark of the beast thing, and he will be worshipped by the world. You know, the biggest question through this whole COVID thing among undiscerning Christians has been, is the vaccine the mark of the beast? I literally have people knocking on my front door asking me that question. And obviously, undeni undeniably, unequivocally, no, it's not the mark of the beast. Because if it was, we'd be in the tribulation, and we'd know who the Antichrist is. Uh, but secondly, uh, the Bible says that the mark of the beast in Revelation uh, 13 is going to be on the hand, on the forehead. And, and John uses the, the, the word epi, which means on. He's actually on top of, not hoop air, which goes underneath like hypodermic needle. He could have chosen that word, but he chose the word that's on top of. So it's not, it's not the vaccine. And as, as one Christian television host proclaimed that the vaccine contains Satan's blood, now, how they got a vial of Satan's blood, I don't know. I don't want to know. But when you get injected with a vaccine, you get Satan's DNA in you, and so you have to worship the beast, and that's just how it works, right? Uh, obviously, we reject all those uh, crazy, speculative, unbiblical uh, ideas. All right, let's go on to the fourth and final pillar here. The fourth one is the fact that in order for Satan to enact his globalist regime, he has to remove, he has to remove the church. As long as believers are here and granted some sort of access to and influence on the planet, Satan will not be able to fully implement his end times strategy. Listen to this. This is so encouraging. The world is going to hell in a handbasket, right? Society is deteriorating. It's decaying like a rotten piece of meat. But watch this. Just because you're here, you're making a difference. The mere fact that you're alive as the body of Christ, your presence on this planet is making a difference. That's just being here. Now, there's more we can do. But just by being here, we're making a difference. And that's where Paul talks about in, in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, in verses 6 and 7. 
he says that, that the Antichrist will not be revealed until the restrainer is removed. I don't have time to go into a full explanation of that, but suffice it to say that whatever this restrainer is, it has to be more powerful than Satan and the Antichrist. I only know one source of that, and that's God. That's God. So I believe that God, the Holy Spirit, and his influence through the church is what is holding back this tsunami of sin. It's the dam that's keeping evil from completely permeating our society. And when the rapture happens, I believe that particular influence will be removed. Now, the Holy Spirit's still here. He's um, omnipresent, right? But the Holy Spirit came into the world through believers to influence the world at Pentecost when the church was born. It makes sense that the Holy Spirit's influence through the church would leave when the church leaves at the rapture. So I believe that simply by being here, we make a difference and that Satan will not be able to enact his final agenda until the Holy Spirit's influence is removed. That's why he says in verse 8, and then, and then that lawless one will be revealed. But praise God, it says that he will be slayed by God. He'll be slain by God. Revelation 19, 15, at the second coming, Jesus takes the Antichrist and the false prophet and casts them into the lake of fire. Both Satan and a depraved human race want the same thing. They want you gone. They want you to be silenced. They want you to shut up. They want you just simply to go away, to disappear. Isn't that interesting? How that spirit is growing and growing and growing in our society while we're being canceled, while we're being marginalized, while we're being kicked off social media. Just go away so that we can have our own world. My friend, that's going to happen with the rapture. They're going to get exactly what they have asked for but it's going to come back to them in spades. And so these final pillars here, the uniting the nations, deceiving humanity, preparing the Antichrist, removing the church, those are four of the pillars in Satan's uh, globalist strategy. And of course, we are preventing uh, that from happening. So finally, we'll conclude with this here. The global reset is not a conspiracy theory or some sort of wild speculation. It is happening as we speak. Some are already happening governing as if it's happening, and globalists are unashamedly pushing forward their agenda. But as dramatic and reality-altering as it is, it is only part of Satan's forerunner strategy, one that will soften humanity, conditioning them by force and mandate, if necessary, to welcome his incarnate man of sin. The world is longing for a savior, and the devil is about to give them one. Our job is to purify ourselves for our coming groom and to preach the gospel. I had the, the privilege of doing a, uh, a wedding ceremony with W.A. Criswell here many years ago, back in the 90s. And of course, you know, First Baptist Dallas at that time had only had two pastors since 1898. 41 years is great, brother, but I'm 1898, are you kidding me? And Criswell was kind of at the tail end of his, of his reign at First Baptist. So we're down in the, in the bowels of First Baptist Church about to come up for the wedding, and He's wearing his trademark baby blue tuxedo, <laughs> as only Criswell could get away with, right? Nobody else could rock that, but he's doing it. And we're standing there underneath a huge, giant oil portrait of Criswell holding a Bible, and he's standing before me holding the same Bible. And I said, Dr. Criswell, can I ask you a question? He said, sure, son. He said, can I ask you, would you give me any advice as a young minister? If there was anything you could tell me, what would it be? And in his grandfatherly, Moses-like way, he reached forward a trembling hand and he put it on my shoulder. He just said, oh, son, preach the word. Just preach the word. You'll be okay. My friend, that's our job, is to preach the word. And we have a chance to do that right now in this culture in which we're living as we see this globalist agenda coming into view. It's interesting that Mark last night talked about Billy Graham's autobiography, uh, because God had also led me to include an illustration from that book as well. It must be that like minds think alike, Mark. I don't know if it's great minds, but like minds at least think alike. And in Billy Graham's biography, Just As I Am, he tells the story of meeting with John F. Kennedy. He says, I had the privilege of ministering to many presidents, but one of the most special relationships I had was with John F. Kennedy. He said, on the day of his inauguration, President Kennedy asked me, he said, Mr. Graham, would you ride with me in my limousine back to the White House? He said, of course, I'd be happy to, Mr. President. He said, on the way back to the White House, he said, the president turned to me, he said, Mr. Graham, do you believe in the second coming of Jesus Christ? 
when I read that, I thought, wow, I never knew Kennedy ever got near those thoughts. Graham said, of course I do. It's in the Bible. He said, well, does, does my church believe in it? And Graham said, well, it's in their creeds. Kennedy said, that's very interesting. I'd like to talk to you more about that sometime. He said, we went our separate ways. He said, you know, we had some instances where we passed each other, but never really conversations. But then on January of 1963, we were both at the presidential prayer breakfast. And he said, Kennedy got up and gave a speech. It really was a great speech. And, and Graham followed it up with a very good speech of his own short speech. Afterwards, as they're walking to their car, he said it was a cold, bitter January day. And President Kennedy turned to me and says, Mr. Graham, would you ride with me once again in my limousine? I really need to talk to you. He said, I turned to the president and said, Mr. President, I don't have an overcoat on. I've been bat battling this virus here. I'm he wasn't social distancing. He said, I'm afraid that I might give you this virus. Can we do this another time? The president said, of course, graciously. So he got in his limousine took off. Of course, you know the rest of the story. Ten months later, Kennedy was assassinated. And Graham writes in his autobiography, he says, that to me was an irrecoverable moment. It was a moment I could never get back again. It was a, a door through which I should have walked, but I didn't. And I regret that irrecoverable moment. Brothers and sisters, we are living in that moment right now. We're in it. And the door is open for us. And we have the opportunity to step through that door and to make an impact in this world, being salt and light and sharing the good news and the hope of Jesus Christ. The question is, will we take advantage? Will we seize the day for the glory of Jesus Christ? And every believer in this room is commissioned, including myself, to do that very thing. We cannot look back one day and say, I wish I had taken advantage of that moment. This is the moment we're living in. We must walk through that door. Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you that even though we see Satan's agenda all around us, signs of it every day, just like floodwaters encroaching on the shoreline and coming up to our doorstep and coming up to our doors and flooding our homes, God, we're living in it right now. And yet, Lord, the darker the night, the brighter the light. And the more Satan tries to enact his agenda, we know that you also have an agenda. You have an agenda to purify your bride, to wake your bride, to get her ready for the return of her beloved, to long for, to eagerly anticipate that glorious day. And Lord, you also have an agenda for us to do all that is within our, including our, our, our individual spheres of influence, to try to reach this world for Jesus Christ. And it begins, of course, in the church. So, Lord, thank you for every person who's here today, for the lives that they represent, for the influence that they can have on this dark world. And we thank you, Jesus, that once again, nothing is going to prevent you from accomplishing all of your good pleasure. And for that, we give you thanks this morning. In your precious son's name, amen. Thank you. that concluded, he surveyed 362,000 pastors and only 2% of those pastors said they were willing to address political hot button issues of today, even though they all recognize that they're important issues. I think it takes a certain boldness to address those. I mean, it, it's really kind of like the Old Testament prophets, kind of like John the Baptist. I mean, John wasn't afraid to call out Herod. Uh, I think there's a time and a place for that. I think we can obviously take it too far and be too political. We need to be in the scriptures. But it's the world that our people are living in. And I think there's times when we, we have to declare the word of God on the nation and what's happening out there in the world. Um, you know, some people say it's, you kind of, you know, crossing the streams, if you will, to have these patriotic Sundays and that type of thing. And, and that's really a personal decision that people can make. But I think we definitely should address those issues, just not let, let, let it drive the narrative. As you're going through a passage of Scripture, there's a time when that, yeah, this applies to this area, and we simply address it. I think more than that, though, is the idea that we equip the saints for the work of service, and the idea that we, we gather to equip and we scatter to make a difference in the world. And I think it's those, uh, pardon the expression, the foot soldiers of the army of the Lord are the ones that really make the difference out there in the world. People that are out there uh, on their school boards, out there in their community, making a difference in person-to-person -person ways, and obviously reaching people that as a minister, or as a pastor, you and I'll never reach. So, good question.
Hey, Jeff, by the way, uh, my wife and I watched Greater a couple years ago. Oh, cool. Very good movie. Didn't know you had anything to do with that till today. Yeah, cool. Uh, and I just finished coming to Posse like three days ago. So um, I've never been to this type of event. It's my, my first time. And uh, when, it, when we introed ourselves yesterday, I said, I'm really just a businessman and a layman who loves the word of God. I feel like in my circles with laymen and businessmen, I, I know the word pretty well, but there's so many preachers in here and so many Bible scholars, I feel like a B-teamer in this group because <laughs> there's so many that have gone to school and been to seminary and all this kind of stuff. You made a comment earlier about uh, we shouldn't be surprised when the world, uh, you know, that the world is acting the way it is and unbelievers look at this and we shouldn't be shocked at that. I'm not shocked at that. I'm more shocked at the Christian layman businessmen in my circle that are a, either clueless mm -hmm. about what is going on or deliberately seem to not want to see it. Right. So my question to you is, um, do you have two or three silver bullet scriptures that you could just give me that I could share that would just shut their mouth and make them really pay attention? I know there's a bunch. <laughs> <laughs> I know there's a bunch. I, I'm looking for something that's really direct from a rifle. Yeah. <laughs> well, you have to begin by grabbing them by the lapels. That's where it begins. No, no you're absolutely correct. And, and the reason for that, just to back up just for a second, is because we're living in a day uh, of, of massive, a massive lack of discernment in the body of Christ. And the reason why we have no discernment is because we have no Bible. Uh, the Bible produces a sermon. The more we get into the Bible, the more the Bible gets into us. Uh, Barna did a study, another study where he concluded that 19% of Christians read their Bibles every week. 18% uh, uh, never read them at all, ever. And only 14% of Christians read their Bibles every day. During COVID, that number dropped to 9%. So we went home, but we didn't do anything about it. We didn't get into the Word. That's the root cause of this. Uh, Really, I would just say it's not so much a specific scripture as the overall impetus to get into the Word of God. I mean, some Christians can't tell you what they believe or why they believe, especially when it comes to the end times. And what they've done is just gather a bunch of apocalyptic tidbits, put them together like a Picasso portrait, and that's their view of what's going on in the world. I would just simply encourage them to get into the Bible. All scripture is given by inspiration of God, and it's profitable. And 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. So I would encourage them to simply get into a Bible study. Maybe you need to start a Bible study with some men. Maybe two men, maybe three men. And you meet for breakfast and you just get together. You go through one of Olivier's devotionals and one of the books that, that have been uh, written by some of these men here and simply begin to lead them. And that's how it begins, my friends. Because so many people are not being equipped in their churches and some are not taking what they're getting in their churches and taking it home. And sometimes there has to be sort of a grassroots campaign. And we're seeing a lot of that, by the way, happening. I was going to say, yeah. Three years ago, the person that had the biggest impact on me as far as the Bible was John Carter. Mm -hmm. Three years ago, I started reading Real Men. Mm -hmm. And we're still in that. And he's got a life that's completely changed. Absolutely. Every Paul needs a Timothy. Every Timothy needs a Paul. But we just moved back to Little Rock a year ago after being uh, in North Arkansas for a while. And as soon as I came back, I mean, people literally knocking on my door saying, would you teach us the Bible? We're not getting any Bible at our church. And so I, I just said to the Lord, my wife, I just said, well, let's just do what we can do. So we're meeting on a Wednesday night at a facility with a group of people, and we're just teaching through the Bible. And I'm like, where are these people? And so it, it begins with a hunger, and it begins with someone who's willing to take uh, the baton and be willing to pass it on to this. So maybe God's calling you to do that. Maybe God's calling somebody else here to do that as well. That may be one of your action points from this conference. Good point. Thank you. I'm sorry. Thank you for the talk. Something I've been puzzled about as we talk about the coming Antichrist, world government, that kind of thing, the talks, the concentration understandably, is focused on the reunited Roman Empire, or whatever you want to call it. It's Europe, and then of course we're in the U.S., we talk a lot about the U.S. What I don't understand is how does this fit in with the 
uh, one and a half billion Chinese people and the 1.2 billion folks in India, China in particular, um, they haven't had a history of wanting to have any kind of reunification with Rome in any way, shape, or form. Mm -hmm. Obviously, the Bible says what it says. I'm not going to deny that. But looking ahead, it's hard to see. Of course, two years ago, who would have thought the whole world could unite around something, and they right. did. How, how, does, how does the East pay, fold into all of this? Mm -hmm. Great question. There's some, there's some different opinions on that, but I'll just give you one. Is that Revelation 16 says that they're, they're going to gather, these demons are going to entice the nations to gather together to make war with God. And one of the dynamics of the tribulation, for even those of us who've written books about it, we still don't fully understand how acute, how, how incredibly amazing and supernatural this tribulation period is going to be. You and I are not living in an age of complete global delusion, of an age where Satan really is in control of the minds of people of the earth. And for whatever reason, these nations are going to gather for the purpose of fighting against God. S Satan, through the Antichrist, is going to convince the whole nations that they can defeat this God, or else why would they come together to try to go to war with him? So there's going to be a supernatural element to that. That's the only way I can explain it, is that they come together. They may be enticed initially for, by some other reason, but eventually it's going to be because they really believe we can't continue on the planet if the Nazarene comes back and destroys this good thing we've got going on. Like I said, there are other opinions on that, but that's just one of them. Thank you, sir. Yes, sir. Hi there. I have more a question of style than of substance. Mm -hmm. When I talk to friends and people in Mineola, Texas, if you use the words antichrist, world dictator, um, man of sin, what comes to their mind is a caricature like a Hitler type person right. who stops around and, and looks like a machine and is stupid. Is there a way of communicating to this kind of an audience? Again, I think part of it is the stumbling word of antichrist. I know it's mm -hmm. a biblical word, mm -hmm. but it communicates something that does not relate to the picture we read in Scripture. Yeah. How would you help that problem? I, I would just simply say, based on Revelation 6, 1, that the antichrist, when he comes, he comes with a, a bow but no arrow, signifying that he conquers peacefully, is the idea there's going to be a a welcomed world leader in a time of great crisis. I mean, even right now, if somebody stepped to the forefront and just kind of wiped this whole COVID thing away, the whole world bowed his feet. B bring peace to the Middle East, you know, disarm nuclear weapons, all these things. It'd be hailed as a Messiah. So I would just put it in terms of a welcomed world leader during a time, the context of great crisis. I mean, when you're feeling the heat in your own life and this chaos that we're going through, and you get a little stimulus, a little help, you feel a little bit of relief. Imagine, multiply that globally. That's what, that's what this Antichrist figure is going to do. So he's going to come on board as someone who's very charming, who's very welcoming. I mean, kind of like a Barack Obama who came on the world and for you know, at least certain side of the aisle, welcomed him as, this guy's going to make the, the, the waters rise in the oceans. This is going to be amazing. And so that's exactly the kind of spirit I think is going to happen. It's people going to be uh, welcoming them during a time of great crisis. And, of course, that crisis, I believe, is the, the rapture of the church and the post-rapture crisis. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you. There seems to be a little confusion about the Roman Empire. Isn't it more the type of government because we have Babylon and then we have Medo-Persia in the same landmass? Then we have uh, Alexander the Great, same landmass, all three of them. Alexander died in Babylon. So they all contain the same basic area of the earth. So we're talking about Rome. Isn't it just a type of government that we're dealing with? Yeah, I think it is. I think it's a, a type of a, of revived Roman Empire. I think the headquarters will be at Babylon. I, I take a, a literal Babylon position. Um, but it'll be in the spirit of a revived Roman Empire. It'll begin by ruling over that whole uh, former Roman Empire area. But eventually, I think it'll take over all the earth. The crazy thing about when you start trying to speculate about how will this actually come together? And what does this mean for this country? And people say, well, you know, is America mentioned in the Bible? No, well, you know, other countries, Mexico is not mentioned in the Bible, Bible prophecy. Um, and there are many reasons for that, but most of which is the fact that we don't know exactly how these nations are going to conglomerate, how they're going to ally with one another, and how they'll be represented as a part of that 10-king 
confederation. And there'll be other nations that'll be obviously against Antichrist as well in the beginning, and they'll be taken out. So, Jeff, I want to um, compliment you on your presentation. It was Thank outstanding. You. And I wanted to make a comment about a previous question mm -hmm. and get your response. Mm -hmm. I think the reason, one of the reasons the church is so ineffective in the world today is because we have allowed society to define what we can speak on. And they say, well, that's a political issue. That's a political issue. Mm -hmm. Abortion, transgenderism, mm -hmm. same-sex marriage, even the national debt mm -hmm. are moral issues yes. that should be addressed in the church. Mm -hmm. And yeah. my hero in the faith is Don Wildman, who started doing this in the 70s. Mm -hmm. And um, I had a personal conversation with him in which he told me that his greatest critics were pastors mm -hmm. who either told him you shouldn't be yeah. talking about things right. like that, mm -hmm. or they told him you've been speaking for 30 years and it's worse than when you began, so yeah. when are you going to stop? Right. And his response was, God didn't call me to win. He called me to stand. Right. We will win when Jesus Christ returns. Amen. Amen. Well, I can't disagree with that, and uh, I support that 100%. You know, part of what people in the world want to know from their pastor is, does any of this matter to my real life? And guess what? They live in the real world. So if they're experiencing things in the real world and the church simply ignores that, you don't think that the early church at some time when they gathered together on a Sunday evening didn't talk about that statue of Caesar and how they were required to bow before it as they passed by? I don't think they address all these things in society. And so, but, but the spiritual principles that we do see in the Bible, they do speak to those things, and they relate and apply to those very issues. So, no, we cannot be silent. Uh, it is a time, there is a time to stand. I mean, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego didn't just, you know, stand up in their, their hearts. I mean, they stood up in the town square before the statue. Uh, Daniel continued praying. The first thing he did publicly, you know, Peter and John, we cannot stop speaking of these things which we've seen and heard. The Hebrew midwives, they disobeyed man and obeyed God. So, yeah, th these are definite issues that we have to take bold stands on. And guess what? Light attracts heat. You know, light uh, emanates heat and light attracts bugs. So you're going to get bugs when you shine the light out there for Jesus Christ. And you're going to be persecuted. Jesus said in John 15, listen, if they persecuted me, what do you think they're going to do to you? I mean, we think that if we just present this nice, kind, gentle, friendly Jesus and we're, we go out and we, we feed people and we go help them paint their house and landscape their lawn, that the world will say, man, Christianity is the greatest thing that ever happened. I think I'll give my life to Christ. Well, the Bible says, no, they're going to hate you. They're going to hate the, the most loving person who ever walked the planet. They butchered him and crucified him. What do you think the world we're living in is going to do to us? So, yeah, I mean, being nice is good, but that's not... The message, the message is to preach the gospel and to share truth and love with them. Yeah, nice is not one of the fruit of the spirits. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> that's why you're not Tommy Nice. Tommy Ice. Is that yes, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> Go ahead. Yes, sir. Hey, Jeff. Yes, sir. Um, the, the first gentleman that asked a question, I just want to tack on what he said because he was coming from what pastors should be doing in church. Now, the rest of us, I know we're supposed to be salt and light, spreading the word. Mm. I want to get your take on what we should be doing to try to um, get conservatives in office and get rid of these machines so they can't steal another election. Mm -hmm. Well, fortunately, we live in a country that allows us to go to the polls and vote. It allows us to march. It allows us to protest. It allows us to lobby. It allows us to make contact with our representatives. Uh, we're not in a, in a communist China regime. We're not in a place right now. I mean, obviously, we see more government overreach and government tyranny creeping in with its fingers here and there. But as long as there's freedom, we need to exercise the freedom, the freedom of, of free speech, the freedom to assemble, uh, the, the freedom uh, to bear arms. All these things are freedoms and rights that we've been given. So I would just say simply take advantage of the freedoms you have. Don't ignore the freedoms that you have. And, you know, for, good men, for evil to prosper, good men just simply need to do nothing. And so if we just do nothing, and, and here's the thing. In, in our world, most of you are, are, you know, older, about my age, you know, we're old people, right? Born during the Eisenhower administration, okay? And uh, we have lived in a place, this country, that has really had our back for decades, right? I mean, the morality that we stand up for in the church, 
the world believed, our, our government believed. The society promoted that. I mean, these, these moral aberrations were anomalies. They weren't the norm like they are today. But that's no longer the case, my friend. Uh, we're living un, under, under paganism. We're living in post-Christian America. And so now we get the chance to experience just a little bit of what the early church experienced. Because when they went out there in the world, they never knew what was going to happen, but they had to do what they could do. But when they came together, as, when they assembled together, and, and not forsook it as is the habit of some, guess what happened? They grew stronger, and they changed the course of human history under this pagan regime that was hostile to them. So we're not there yet. So I would just simply say, whatever freedom that you have to do in your area to begin to do that, do it. Just do it. Don't wait for somebody to come knock on your door and recruit you. Go ahead and get out there and do it. A lot of people think that, uh, you know, we, two years ago, I'm sure one of you, the questions that people ask you the most was, where does America fit in Bible prophecy? And, of course, that question uh, has declined in the last two years. Um, so where do you put Gog and Magog? Uh, because I tend to think that that's going to happen early on, and it's going to remove, for example, Islam as an influence, which a lot of people say, well, how could you have these kinds of things happening with Islam so dominant in the world? What's your view on that? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, I wrote a book called The End of America, question mark, where I examined the seven different views of where people think they see America in Bible prophecy. I, I personally don't see America there. But, yeah, concerning uh, Gog and Magog, you know, the, the, one of the key issues uh, that you have to work around is, you know, Ezekiel 38 talks about Israel living securely in the land. The question is, what does living securely really mean? Well, it certain, certainly doesn't mean last April when they had 4,170 rockets fired in the course of 30 days into Israel. So it certainly doesn't mean that. So the question is, what does living securely mean? Something has to happen, I believe, to decimate the Islamic military forces and the Islamic control over the Temple Mount. Something has to get that out of the way. I don't think that any man can come in and just simply negotiate that deal. I think something has to happen. The War of Gog and Magog best explains that. So to me, it seems like either right at the cusp of the peace treaty, the, uh, the Daniel 9 a peace treaty signed with the Antichrist of Israel, that that's when it's going to happen in that inter-period uh, between the rapture and the signing of the treaty, or just at the moment, or just after that. Because it's going to be a very short war. It's going to be the one-day war, the one-hour war, whatever it ends up being. And that's going to enable Israel, through the, and the Antichrist, I think maybe you can take credit for that, is going to enable Israel to raise that dome of the rock and to rebuild the temple on that spot. So, yeah, I agree with you that, that there's going to have to be some sort of removal of the Islamic power before the temple can be rebuilt. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Appreciate it.